Welcome or welcome back Midnight Mafia and today on this Friday I am going to try to drop the story at exactly midnight. It might come out a few minutes close to it but I'm trying to hit that Midnight Mafia with a Friday Midnight Extreme True Crime that I hope you're going to love. Also don't be shy, notice that I have merch all right here and I'm putting up new designs almost every day I'm trying at least and also please become a member of patreon it's right there in the description or if you just want to talk to us join the discord I am on there at least every other day and I'll talk to you directly and we can just chat all those links are right there in the description last week our video got up to 65 views we were five short so I think that kind of deserves a bonus story don't you guys well either way let's get this one up to 70 so I can give you that bonus story this week okay I just want to let you guys also know on a side note that I want to say thank you and I truly love all of you for the support that you guys have given me over the last year I mean without you guys I would not still be telling stories and even though I had high hopes of this channel blowing up at the beginning I've realized that it's gonna be a grind and it might take years if it ever happens but it's what makes me happy so if you like true crime, mysterious, or paranormal stories, I just encourage you to stick around and join the community, join the family, and thank you guys. Okay, so without any further ado, as of now, it's time to slip into a mind that's not our own. Let's go. On October 16th, 1991, a man named George Hennard, overcome with this harsh emotion, decided to blow off his anger and go for a drive. So that's when he strapped himself into his pickup truck, he grabbed the wheel, and then he drove off. But you see, it ended up in disaster because he ended up driving into a restaurant. And that restaurant was called Luby's Cafeteria in Killeen, Texas and it destroyed the whole front of this restaurant. I mean, this was a horrible accident, or so it seemed. George Pierre Hennard was born on October 15th, 1956 in Pennsylvania, later known as George Joe Hennard, and he grew up with a surgeon father and a homemaker as a mother. And they had to move frequently for his father's army hospital job, even living in New Mexico at one point. And Hennard was popular and outgoing at school, earning the nickname Jojo. But everything changed after a fight with his tough father. And his life then took a turn. Because the next day at school, Hennard's hair was so badly and brutally cut that it appeared that it had been chopped off halfway with a butcher's knife. And then the once outgoing Hennard was now transformed into this introverted teenager and he was no longer to be able to just be himself. So as the years went on through high school, he just kept to himself and he had no interest in talking or making friends with any girls and his parents seemed unconcerned and were often absent and just didn't care. But he did graduate high school in 1974 and that's when Hennard went to join the Navy. And after serving three years in the military receiving an honorable discharge, he joined the Merchant Marines and his work primarily took him to the Gulf of Mexico. And from 1981 onward, he completed a total of 37 overseas voyages. However, as he traveled more, he seemed to get in trouble more. And in 1981, he was found with marijuana in Texas. And then the next year, he reportedly had a racial argument with one of his shipmates, leading to the suspension of his seaman's papers. And according to his acquaintances, Hennard held these strong prejudices against blacks, gays, and Hispanics, and he treated women especially with disdain due to negative experiences with his mother. I mean, he lost his seaman's license again in 1989 after being caught with marijuana again, and that's when he sought help for drug abuse. 
but he just began to drift to these various jobs and eventually ended up living with his divorced mother in her large colonial home in Belton made from a red brick. But by February 1991, Hennard's behavior became bizarre, and that's when he purchased two weapons, a Glock 17 and a Ruger P89. And in June, he sent this weird five-page letter to two of these sisters that lived nearby asking them to meet in this five-page letter. He also expressed his desire to laugh in the face of those who tried to destroy him and his family, mainly women. In two weeks before this crash, Henard quit his job and someone overheard him asking himself what would happen if he killed someone. According to one of his co-workers, Henard repeatedly muttered, watch and see, just watch and see while at work. And he had mentioned having issues with some of the women in Belton. And then on October 15th, which happened to be his birthday, he spoke to his mother over the phone before going to a small restaurant for dinner. And the TV was on showering this coverage of Clarence Thomas's confirmations hearing. He was a Supreme Court judge, and still is, and Henard became furious, particularly during an interview with a woman named Anita Hall. And then the witnesses reported that Henard began screaming and cursing at the TV, specifically calling the woman a derogatory term, and he expressed anger towards the decision made by the bastards who opened the door for women like her. Now at the beginning, I left you kind of on a cliffhanger. Well, I kind of did that intentionally, and you're about to see what really happened on that day. Okay, so the next day after his birthday on October 16th, Henard went to the same convenience store he went to every morning for his regular breakfast of junk food. And this had been his routine for over a year, and staff always remembered him as a brooding man who had a sense of hostility in his eyes. And he was usually in such a hurry but this morning, things were a little bit different. The cashier that handed him his purchases thought he was almost in a friendly and calm demeanor for a change. And she had never, ever seen him like this before. And that's when seven agonizing hours later, Henard's Ford Ranger pickup truck barreled through the front of Luby's cafeteria during the bustling lunch rush. And the sound of the shattering glass just filled the air as the massive vehicle plowed into the restaurant, sending tables and chairs flying in every direction. Then, in a horrifying realization, the patrons there realized it was no accident. When Henard emerged from his truck, brandishing a deadly weapon in each hand. And with a deafening roar, he unleashed a barrage of bullets from this Glock before switching to his Ruger, unleashing chaos and terror upon innocent diners. You gotta remember, over 80 people at that moment were inside, and the crowded cafeteria was a sea of terror and chaos. People frantically were scrambling to find covers. The sound of gunshots just kept echoing through the air and over their heads. And the staff were no match for the gunman as he moved around with this deadly precision, his finger pulling the trigger without hesitation. But amidst the screams and the cries for help, there was actually one moment of mercy. This now cold-blooded killer allowed a mother and her young child to escape. Maybe that's because he thought of himself and his mother at that time. I'm not sure. But it was clear during this whole thing that women were his main target. Because the whole time he ranted and raved about vipers and revenge and fueled by a deep hatred towards women from Colleen and Belton. He always would say that women were just these vipers trying to get him. And as the massacre was unfolding, those inside could do nothing but cower underneath their tables and their chairs praying for their lives. And the only sounds in the room were Henard's shouts and the deafening blasts from the gun. No one dared to make a move towards the door, knowing that it would likely be met with a fatal bullet. And amongst the terrified in the crowd was Sam Wink, who had come to celebrate National Bosses Day with his colleagues. And when the truck crashed through the building, this chaos erupted. And that's when Wink dove for cover and then heard the chilling sound of the gunfire. And it seemed like an eternity as Henard calmly 
just roamed around picking off innocent customers who had come for just a simple lunch. But every single victim was chosen with this malicious intent as Henard glared at them with pure hatred before taking their life. One woman was called a B-word before being shot in the head, while another was hiding under a bench and then was found and just killed there for trying to save herself. And when Henard actually locked eyes with Wink, there was no remorse or fear in his expression at all, only a smirk that sent shivers down Wink's spine. It was truly a scene of unimaginable horror, made even more terrifying by Henard's calm demeanor and intense gaze. In that moment, it was clear that this was not just a random act of violence, but a calculated massacre driven by rage and fury. Then we have Dr. Sean Isdale, a chiropractor who was enjoying a meal with his family, suddenly froze as the serene expression on his face darkened into a mask of fear. And that's when the pickup truck hit, and his eyes then frantically searched for an escape route, but before he could move, a gunshot shattered the stillness. And the sound of chaos kept erupting as Henard's bullets found their targets, and Dr. Isdale's friend Steve Ernst and his wife and even his mother-in-law were there. And as the gunfire paused just momentarily, the silence in the cafeteria was deafening. People held their breath, praying that they would not be the next victim. But of everybody in that crowd and cafeteria, there was one man that knew for a fact that they were all in danger, especially him and he didn't want to take any chances. So Tommy Vaughn, a large auto mechanic worker who was certain he was Henard's next target, without hesitation, he hurled his massive body through a window in a desperate attempt to escape. And it worked as he went flying through the window and then got up and ran on the other side. And panic consumed the diner as they followed Vaughn's lead, scrambling and pushing towards the windows in a frantic frenzy to save themselves from the madness unfolding before them. It was survival at all costs as they fought against each other for precious seconds of freedom. Now the list of victims just continued to grow, reaching a staggering 50 in total. Shockingly, 23 were killed and 27 were left wounded, their lives forever altered by the ruthless violence that unfolded that day. And each name will be displayed on the screen at the end as a somber memorial to their tragic death. Meanwhile, just two buildings down from Luby's restaurant where the massacre was taking place, an auto theft prevention seminar was going on and that was being held at that Sheridan Hotel. Little did anybody know that there were actually five Texas law enforcement officers there and that they would be thrust into a terrifying battle for survival just minutes later. And as the urgent call for assistance just echoed throughout the airwaves, these seven now brave officers sprang into action and rushed to the scene. See, back then, there was no training for managing an active shooter scenario. So they had no time to waste as these innocent lives just hung in the balance. So three officers charged into the building while the other four formed this perimeter around it. And despite the chaos and the danger that surrounded them, these officers fearlessly pressed forward. With adrenaline just coursing through their veins, they aggressively fired upon the shooter many times, determined to put an end to his deadly rampage. And finally, after being shot three times himself, Henard came to a sudden stop and retreated towards the back of the restaurant. In the back of the restaurant, there was this little alcove, and that's where Henard ended up going into this alcove that was near the restrooms. And Henard was not yet finished with his heinous act. In one final horrific act, he needed to end his own life with a gunshot to the head. The echoes of his shot still reverberating throughout the building as a haunting reminder of the senseless tragedy that occurred that day. But we're gonna go a little deeper because could all of this had been prevented? Henard exhibited a deep hatred towards women, although the reason for this is still not clear, but he often got into these heated arguments with his mother and would even draw disturbing caricatures of her with a snake's body. Clearly also threatening to kill his mother many times was a warning, and he would still then go to live with her. This trend of having issues with their mothers can be seen in many serial killers. 
Hennard also had a preference for music that glorified violence against women and would refer to them as disgusting and vile creatures. Most of Hennard's victims were women, and based on how he carefully chose who to shoot on that fateful day, it is likely that he specifically targeted the females. And back in June, when he sent that five-page letter to Jana Jernigan, 19, and her sister, Jill Fritz, 23, in this rambling letter, he seemed to have created a fantasy relationship with the sisters while also expressing anger towards women in general. The sister's mother felt uneasy after reading the letter and brought it to the attention of the police. But once it was brought to the police, it received little response. She then showed it to her husband, who was a hospital administrator, and after consulting with a psychiatrist that was on staff, they concluded that Hennard had an unhealthy fascination with the sisters and may pose a danger. Now, what ultimately pushed him over the edge remains unknown but experts believe it could be attributed to his isolation from society, these feelings of rejection and deep-seated anger towards women and the world. I mean, after the massacre, investigations revealed that Hennard fit the profile of a mass murderer. Hennard was described as a muscular and handsome man from a privileged background. And he was also described as a loner and a loser by those who knew him. He had purchased these guns in Nevada, possibly triggered by recent rejection and an interest in serial killers, and he often talked about killing himself and was known for his rude and combative behavior and nature. I mean, even his co-workers were glad to see him leave when he lost his job on the sea. Police discovered his obsession with serial killers in the song Don't Take Me Alive, a 1989 calendar found at his home revealed dark thoughts about redemption. And one of the remarks on the calendar read, there is no hope and not a prayer. Two videotapes were found among Hennard's belongings as well. One about the Lockerbie bombing and the other about mass murders. And it was discovered that he had been researching massacres for months before committing his own. I mean, the community responded quickly with support for those affected by the massacre. Authorities investigated Hennard's life and found drugs, misogyny, and personal issues to be factors in his actions. But one of the good things was local gun laws were changed as a result of Luby's massacre. In 1995, Texas passed a law allowing anyone who meets a strict criteria to obtain a concealed handgun license. One survivor, Susanna Hupp, was a strong advocate for this change. She also served in the Texas House of Representatives from 1997 to 2006. A memorial was built near the site of Luby's to honor those who were killed and injured during the massacre. And despite efforts to repair or redesign the restaurant, the business declined and it eventually closed in September of 2000. Survivors still recall hiding under those anxious tables as Hennard walked around shooting, and the police arrived to stop him. One witness remembers Hennard's wide eyes as he drove into the building. Susanna Hupp, previously known as Susanna Gracia, was a regular at Luby's restaurant and friends with the manager, Mark Copenhaff. And on the day of the shooting, Copenhaff invited her for lunch, but she declined because, you know, she was busy. However, her parents, Al and Ursula, also asked her to join them for lunch at Luby's. They usually had a regular table, but this time they decided to sit somewhere else. And as they were finishing their meal, Copenhaif left to go to the back to the kitchen just as the truck came crashing through the window. And the Gracias immediately took cover when the shooting began. And Hupp remembered that her gun was not in her purse, but in her car due to laws preventing her from carrying it at all times. And at that moment, despite his age, Hupp's father, Al, charged towards the shooter before being shot in the chest. He tried to save everybody. Meanwhile, Tommy Vaughn, as you know, tried to break a window at the back to escape through the restaurant, which worked. But see, it wasn't Vaughn's strength alone. Luckily, one of Hennard's bullets had weakened the glass and it shattered. And this gave the opportunity for up to 50 people to escape through that broken window. Hupp also ran towards the window and urged the mother to follow. And then she made it outside. But when she did, she realized her mother 
hadn't been with her. And later, law enforcement officers revealed that Hupp's mother had been shot in the head, right next to Hennard, while comforting her husband that was just shot in the chest. So both of Hupp's parents were killed in the tragedy. And it was later discovered that George Hennard struggled with this deep hatred towards women, as we know by now, due to this tumultuous relationship he had with his mother. But see, Hennard also had these beliefs about not just women that he disliked, but also other ethnicities like Hispanics. It is believed that he chose that restaurant because it was close to the border of Mexico and would have a high percentage of female patrons as well. Additionally, the rejection from the merchant marines may have contributed to his actions on that fateful day. He longed to return to the open sea where he could be surrounded by his fellow sailors. I mean, being a sailor in those days meant being among men, as women were not common on ships. It was the only time in his life where he truly seemed content, and perhaps it was the distance and isolation from his parents that brought him that peace. He could escape the constant fighting with his mother and humiliation from his father. But on that day that Henard crashed his truck through Luby's and opened fire on innocent bystanders, it's likely that he already had lost touch with reality and just snapped. He was well prepared for the attack and had put a lot of thought into it. Some may argue that his death that day was a blessing. But in some ways, it's a tragedy because we will never know what ultimately led George Hennard to do such a horrific act. I know that one was intense, guys, but thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you liked it, make sure to hit like, and I'll see you guys soon. Cheers. The names of those that were sadly affected by this tragedy are as follows.